Uh, can I get two people to read this or passage today? Someone to read verses 1 through <clears throat> 10, and then someone to read verses 11 through 19. Are you going to do 11, 1 through 10? And then someone one can do 11 through 19? Now Saul was still bringing threats of murder against the disciples of the Lord. He went to the high priest and requested letters from him to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any men or women who belonged to the way, he might bring them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he traveled and was nearing Damascus, a light from heaven suddenly flashed around him. Falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul said. I am Jesus, the one you were persecuted, he replied. But get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the sound but seeing no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they took him by the hand and led him to Damascus. He was unable to see for three days and did not eat or drink. The disciple... And there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias, Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, here I am, Lord, he replied. The Lord told him, Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. Great. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. So, big story here, obviously. And, uh... We're going to just take it verse by verse, kind of as we had before. Last week, we did have a, a map up here, and just to, just to see some of Philip's travels, and to see where he was going down on the desert road, and um, kind of where Ethiopia was located in, regard, in relation to Palestine. And so today, uh, I think we'll, we'll draw one on the fly here. Not right now, but as we, as we get into this. So. You have to bear with me for that. So, verse 1. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. Uh, and he went to the high priest, and then it continues on to verse 2. So he's still breathing out, according to, this, this, according to Luke, breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples, which sounds pretty bad, right? <laughs> like, this is the second time that we've seen Saul so far in the book of Acts. First time was with um, the stoning of Stephen, right? And um, people were laying their, their cloaks at, at uh, Saul's feet. So apparently they could have you know, more mobility to throw, throw, throw rocks at Stephen. And he was approving of that. And then here we see him for the second time just being described as... Uh, a major opposer of Christianity, and that's that's number one on the fill in the blanks. I couldn't think of a good way to say that, and it's not a good way to say it, but it gets the point across. Saul has been introduced as a major um, opposer, I guess, of enemy. Christianity. Enemy? Yeah, enemy. That's that is far better. Is a major enemy of Christianity this far? Very good. <laughs> There's just one of those times where it's like, man, I can't really think of like the appropriate word there, which happens a lot to me. But I was, it, originally I wrote 
a major villain of Christianity, but that kind of makes him sound like he's on the Christian side, he's just a villain, like, <laughs> representing Christianity, and it's like, that's not what, <laughs> that's not what we're going for here. It's a major enemy, thank you, less of Christianity thus far, and that is referring to chapter 9, verse 1. So, little little note here on verse 1 about that, that phrase, breathing out murder threats. So the persecutor's condition is described as breathing out murderous threats, a phrase which means that threatening and murder with the atmosphere which he breathed and by which he lived. <laughs> and that's a reference from Reinecker. But that is a pretty terrible way to be described, obviously. It's not something that like you want to have in your bio. <laughs> Just an atmosphere of murderous threats. And, uh, it's a terrible thing. So he's being presented as this horrible man. Like the reader, you know, thus far, obviously we know, we've seen the end of the book of Acts, and we've read some of Saul slash Paul's epistles, and so we know what happens. But at this point, I mean, this guy is a pretty bad dude. I mean, he is, he is <coughs> one of the big opponents of Christianity all the actions of the apostles and, and Christians. So, bad guy. Uh, we'll get that till later. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there, who that, any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. So, he wants this complete eradication of Christianity in Jerusalem. Um, he doesn't want there to be any Christians. He wants them all to be put in jail and just kind of quiet it down. I mean, just to really not be heard from ever again. So Damascus, for, for us here in North America, who do not know where that is? So you got the coastline here, right? Um, you got the Mediterranean Sea. And then you have what well, kind of Kind of goes up like that. You probably bends a little bit more. Then you have the uh, the Dead Sea down here, and you got the Jordan River, and then you have the <laughs> I can't draw all the little indentations or anything like that. But this is the Sea of Galilee. And so, right here, this is probably not fortunately correct, right around here, yeah, Jerusalem, and kind of this, this whole region is really Judea, you have kind of further on, you got Samaria, and then around here on this side to the west is region of Galilee, and so up here, and the Jordan goes up and branches out a little bit, up here you got um, Caesarea Philippi, I don't know how to spell that, so, <laughs> Phil, yeah, that's not right, is it two P's? Something like that. And then, further on up, probably around, somewhere around here, oh my gosh, we have Damascus. So that's a ways away. So really, he is, he wants, uh, he asked them for letters to essentially extradite all of these believers who had essentially seeking refuge up in Damascus, who had, who had fled from Jerusalem because of all the persecution going on, fled up to Damascus, and he, he wants these letters so that he can go to the synagogues in Damascus for the local Jews there, and then take all these people who were up there in the first place. So that's what he's doing, and this is a pretty long journey. Uh, I've seen a few maps and people, I've seen two different routes, but one of them looks like something like this, and then the other one looks something more along, more like that. So one crosses a little bit lower on the Jordan, one crosses kind of towards the middle of it. But then anyway, Paul does this journey, and it's about a six-day journey. So he's he is very committed to this. It's not like 
he's just like, well, I'd like to spend my weekend bringing bringing uh, Christians back to Jerusalem so we can put them in prison. I mean, this is this is very committed. It's, it shows that he's very devoted to persecuting believers, followers of the way, as it is described here in, in uh, Acts 9. And I think it's described that, the believers are described that way a few more times throughout this book. So, he wants to take them as prisoners and uh, bring them back to Jerusalem. So as he neared, verse 3, as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. So, once again, he's almost there. Like, this isn't just a short trip. He's, he's, he's almost there. I mean, maybe somewhere around there, right? He, he sees Jesus. Almost to Damascus. This whole way is plotting in his mind, right? Maybe five and a half, however many days. Same mission, mentally. He's he completely, completely um, on the same, on the same, uh, oh my gosh, I can't think of that word either. But he's got a one-track mind to do one thing. That's to bring these, bring these believers back to Jerusalem. So, right at the very end, then, he, he has this encounter with Jesus. As he neared Damascus on his journey, he suddenly, a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Uh, something that I missed there in, in the set, in 1A. Just, just realizing that now. Saul wants Christianity to be eradicated in Jerusalem. Saul wants Christianity to be eradicated in Jerusalem. So it's kind of interesting just knowing how far that was away. I mean, how this really occurred at the at the last possible moment, essentially. You need two things. Need two or just one? No. Come on. Two more. Oh. Francis, take that one. Thank you. So this is really, really right up to the. Right to the grind here, right at the very last moment, he sees uh, Jesus intervene. So, in this in this intervention, uh, he hears this voice, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He says, Who are you, Lord? Saul asks. So he doesn't he doesn't know him. Saul Saul doesn't know him. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. He replied. So. Jesus is speaking from heaven, which affirms once again that he has ascended to the Father, right? And that's in Acts 1. And his statement is kind of interesting. It might not necessarily be what we were expecting. So what's what's kind of unique about Jesus' statement to Saul here, or his question, rather? It looks like Saul persecuted the Christians, but he was only persecuting his Christ. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, why are, you, why are you persecuting me? So, give me a little bit more on that, if you guys would. Uh, what's, that is that is the thing that we're the referring to. The best thing Paul was that he was a zealot. Mm -hmm. And he thought he was doing something great for God. Yeah. He thought he was stamping out of heresy. Yeah. Out of his, out of his uh, synagogues. Right. So now he's being... Told quite dramatically that no, he's not defending God. He's actually in opposition to it. Mm -hmm. And and Paul, being the person that he was, I mean, this is well life changing for him. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. He was very zealous for his people and for his God, and here he's found out he's wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Right. All that 
energy and focus and time spent <laughs> achieving quite the opposite of what he thought he was. I find it interesting that before that he says, Who are you, Lord? Mm -hmm. that, uh, that Paul would uh, recognize that there's a higher authority there. Of course, he saw the light and everything, but still, but yeah. it's kind of a strange word to use in that circumstance, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I've, on, on that same note, I did read from. Uh, from F.F. Bruce that essentially, I mean, he says Kyrio, they're um, one of the, one of the um, like Kyrio is the root word, I guess, for, for Lord in Greek, but he says it's a kind of the equivalent of what F.F. Bruce says, of like sir or something like that, and so it may not be essentially what maybe we would read into that saying we know it's the Lord Jesus, which obviously there's a lot of reverence and a lot of power associated with that. But that's what, if he does recognize something's going on, there's something significant happening here, obviously. Yeah, absolutely. Very much so. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. And in verse 6, Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. So Paul's already planning or Saul was already planning on going into the city, um, and now he has some kind of a new motiva motivation. There's, there's, there's something that has changed in his experience and in his, in his plan. Seven, the men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They had heard the sound but did not see anyone. So this is the, oh, number two. That's, that's something we already said. So we'll do 2 and 2a. So interestingly, Jesus declares that he is the one that Saul is persecuting. Jesus de interestingly, Jesus declares that he is the one that Paul is, or Saul, excuse me, is, is uh, persecuting. Could you give us the number one again? Number one is Saul has been introduced as a major enemy of Christianity thus far. Saul has been introduced as a major enemy of Christianity thus far. Saul wants Christianity to be eradicated in Jerusalem. Thank you. Yeah. And then 2a, from this, from this verse here, we see that it's clear that only Saul truly experienced this encounter with Jesus. Can you repeat any place? 2a. 2a is, it's clear that only Saul truly experienced this encounter with Jesus. So these men, I mean, they heard they heard the sound, but they didn't really get much more than that. It seems like they didn't see see what Paul saw. And then in verse eight, Saul got up got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by hand into Damascus. So this is. Probably not exactly how he thought he was going to be entering Damascus. I mean, like we've said up to this point, he's he's had it in his mind that he had a very clear mission to go in there and to to capture these these Christians who had fled to Damascus and bring them back to Jerusalem for the purpose of putting them in prison. Men and women, I mean, just whoever professed Jesus to be Lord, they were they were going to get the chains. So this is, this is a, a very different way than what he was originally planning. And uh, Reese says on this, that, well, it's actually some, someone else he, he cites, but Saul at this time presents a sad and pathetic picture. Saul, the proud persecutor, clothed with authority from the Sanhedrin, now becomes the convicted, blind, and helpless one, and has to be led into the city of Damascus to wait for further instruction. And then Reese says, the mission he had started out from Jerusalem to accomplish in Damascus is abandoned, and the letters to the synagogues are not delivered. So they, they uh, put a little bit more story in there to kind of give us a bigger picture about what's going on. 
But yeah, this is a very this is a very different event from what he thought it would be. And then in verse uh, nine, for three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. So, what do you think about like what why why would this have happened? Why would why would he not have eat, eaten or drunk anything in response to this event? Or, or it could be that he was um, fasting. You know, if he was a Jew, they knew how to fast. He could have been yeah. fasting, trying to talk to God and see what was really going on. Yeah. It could have been time of grief, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's the clear picture that we get here. I think you're both on, on point there. That He's he's in despair, really. I mean, spiritually, this is this is a heavy event, and uh, he has been convicted, kind of like the, the guy Reese was quoting was saying. It seems like he is grieving. He's fasting. Uh, he didn't eat or drink anything. He can't see all of a sudden from this miraculous event. I mean, he is he is not doing well as a person. He's he is seems like quite depressed and very much in despair. Hopefully some serious reflection was happening in that time as well. So that's 2B. Saul seems to be in spiritual despair as a result of Jesus' intervention. Saul seems to be in spiritual despair as a result of Jesus' intervention. So that's essentially part A, really, to this little passage here, 1 through 19. So here we get to the second part of this story in verse 10. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision. Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. So Ananias is already in Damascus, and we see a little bit later on in the book of Acts, I think it's uh, chapter 22, verse 12, that Ananias, who is a disciple, he is not one of the refugees from that fled from Jerusalem. So he's not necessarily in danger from Saul, uh, but he is a believer of the way, obviously, as he is described here. And so the Lord comes to him in a vision, and he says, yes, Lord. So what's different about Ananias' response to God's, to Jesus' call to him than Saul's? He knew who he was talking to. Yeah, absolutely. That's it. He recognizes the voice, which is pretty reminiscent, if you recall, of one of uh, Jesus' Jesus stories when he was talking about my sheep, you know, my voice. So I think that was that's that's kind of an interesting little part in there. Yes, Lord, he answered. <coughs> Verse 11, the Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. So he gives him some pretty specific instructions here. This, this uh, person who was... Housing Saul for the time being um, has a, has a house on Straight Street, and not that it's that important, but Straight Street apparently was just a pretty major street that ran like east and west in, in Damascus. So that's that's all that really was. And God commands, or Jesus Jesus commands Ananias to go because. Jesus has given another vision to Saul, right? This is the second one that he's received in this, in this pretty short amount of time where he has seen Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. So, verse 13, Lord, Ananias answered, I have already heard, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. So, from verse 1 of chapter 9, we see that this is the understanding at that, 
period of time uh, uh, chronologically where the disciples and believers know this man. He has gained some recognition for being a persecutor of the church. And uh, there's obviously some questions here. <laughs> and Ananias is a little doubtful about what, what the whole purpose of, of going and meeting this man is. Uh, he's, he, I think, I don't know, I mean, what do you think? I, I think if I were in that position, I would have some questions as well. It's like, I don't know, what do you guys think? Well, after Stephen, you'd have to have questions. Yeah. yeah I mean, it's, it's like, you know, why stop it, you know, taking it aside? Why don't you just do away with it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, for real. <laughs> Um, I want to know what what tone of voice God answered him with when he said, you know, after and I kind of questioned him, and then mm -hmm. you know, God says, "Go for go for this man is chosen for the instrument." Blah blah blah. I wonder if that was you know like that mom tone of "I told you to do this," <laughs> yeah. or if it was sign go, it will be okay. Yeah. <laughs> I want to know what type of tone of voice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, yeah. I think he'd be more sympathetic because he'd be like, okay, this guy's afraid, I understand, you don't want to die, so let me just be patient with him. Yeah. Just trust me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know. I mean, obviously we don't really get that in the text, but, I mean, it does kind of make of me think. it does sound ominous, too, and I will show him what he has to say. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, right. <laughs> I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Exclamation point. <laughs> oh, I don't have an exclamation point here on my name. exclamation is after go. I have that one. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just an imperative, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he must, he must have said that. But that's kind of an interesting way to end that as well. Um, I, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. And, I don't know, that that's, that's, seems a little ominous at the reading here, but we obviously know from Paul's, Paul's own epistles and just from his, his own story as a missionary how much he really did suffer for the name of Jesus. But, but the amazing thing is, and the very kind of ironic thing is in light of this story where we are now, is that he counted it as joy to, to suffer for the name of Jesus and that he... Didn't, didn't consider, uh, once again, Romans, Romans 8.18, he didn't consider that the sufferings of this present time were worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. So there's a lot of confidence in his suffering, and, and it didn't seem like a um, punishment for him, like, like in response to what he had done. He didn't really view it as that, just to live as Christ kind of thing, to bear your cross. So... Jesus says, "I will show him how much he, or how he much, how much he must suffer for my name." And here, if this were the burning bush, and we were talking to and Jesus, were well, God was talking to Moses, we would get a lot, a few more uh, resistances before moving on. You would see, like, well, what about this? Well, I can't speak very well, and, and so, so on and so on. But really, the amazing thing here is in uh, verse 17, we read that Ananias went to the house and entered it, placing his hands on Saul. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may, be, that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, oh, gosh, I got so caught up in these things. I missed so many of the fill-in-the-blanks there. So, number three, Ananias, unlike Saul, recognizes Jesus' voice. Ananias, unlike Saul, recognizes Jesus' voice. And then 3a, he originally questions Jesus' command regarding Saul. So if he originally questions Jesus' command regarding Saul. <clears throat> but that's, that's not the end, and he... <laughs> really turns the corner there, and in 3b, in spite of his skepticism, Ananias obeys 
and goes to meet with Saul. It's quite amazing. I think I would have a few more questions. It's pretty impressive the faith that Ananias has. <clears throat> Ananias says what? In, in, uh, in, in spite of his skepticism, Ananias obeys and goes to meet with Saul. Nice. Not to like over spiritualize it or anything like that, but um, it's like if uh, God came to one of us in a vision and, and says, "Go and meet with the, one of the leaders of ISIS or something like that," and because uh, they're here, and I want you to want you to go and meet with them and you lay your hands on. Well, we wouldn't do that, but. Go, go and meet with them and share the gospel with them. It's like, <laughs> that guy's going to kill me. <laughs> it's like, what are you, what are you talking about? I'm, I'm dead if I go and meet with them. This is, this is a big deal. Um, and, he, and he obeys quickly, which is, I don't know, that, that just blows my mind. It's amazing to me. But uh, we see that s some... Some scholars, there's been a little bit of debate. Uh, some people have postulated that Saul kind of converted on the road, and it's, and it's obviously not a um, restoration movement thinking that he did so. But we see that Saul doesn't have the Holy Spirit. It's, it's indicated in the text here in verse 17, and be, that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. So, he, he still is in this, you know, darkness where he doesn't understand what's going on. He doesn't have the Holy Spirit in him. So we think that it, it occurs here a little bit later on right in this passage. So in uh, verse 18, immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. And he got up and he was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. And then um, starting in there, verse uh, part B of verse 19, Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. Okay, so this is really the conclusion of the story. Uh, we see that Ananias, he comes in and he does what he does what Jesus told him to, right? He, he comes in and he lays his hands on Saul and he heals him physically. And obviously, he uh, there, there's some kind of, I don't know, like we don't really know when all this took place, but the gospel was was uh, shared here, whether it be by Jesus in the vision or what, whatever, or, or Ananias coming and talking to him. But to be filled with the Holy Spirit, it's once again associated with what? Wearing a lot of pants. Baptism. What's that? Wearing a lot of pants. Well, yeah, I think it's, yeah, interestingly enough, it's, it's, kind, of, it's, it's kind of both. Because we do know that Paul, Saul slash Paul, does have some miraculous manifestations of the Holy Spirit. We see the indications of that in 1 Corinthians uh, and, uh, and in Timothy. And so, so maybe both here at this time, I don't know, but obviously he, the Holy Spirit is associated with baptism, um, which is once again going back to Acts 2, and that is affirming that once again. So that's important for us to notice. And then... He, he's able to see, right? So he, he has this, this physical vision that's been, that, that, he's, that's, that he has regained. And kind of the cool thing here is, I think it's really paralleled nicely, is that with his physical vision, he's also gained his spiritual vision through the, whole, through the dwelling of the Holy Spirit. It's, it's kind of a both and sort of thing. And so that's actually number four here on the fill in the blanks, that last one. Saul is baptized and is now able to see both physically and spiritually. With the emphasis obviously being on the, the spiritual sight. And it's also a neat little note here that in verse 19a, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. So that spiritual despair that he was in uh, before any of this, well, after the first vision occurred, that has been restored, and now he is, uh, he has some sense of peace within him. There's not that turmoil and grief that he was under when he was fasting and uh, didn't, didn't uh, drink anything or eat anything. So that's uh, 
encouraging to see as well. So um, that's <laughs> pretty much it. Three, three days of not drinking. That looks like he was not feeling well. Yeah. Yeah, I bet so. <laughs> I'd say a physical re reason for him not eating or drinking either is, he was, I mean, I don't mean to be, to lower this, but he was probably afraid he was going to eat a bug. Eat a bug? Yeah, well, I mean, maybe. he couldn't see, so he's like, well, what if, you know, what if, you know. Yeah. I mean, maybe he wasn't thinking about that. But. Yeah, maybe so. Which, that could have caused some distress as well. <laughs> Yeah. Just small honey. Probably afraid somebody gave him something he didn't Probably. And, and the thing is, <laughs> and the thing is, too, now, I don't know this from experience, but I know from people that I've talked to, like when you lose your sight, like this person who can see loses their sight, it's a really traumatic experience. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, that is one of the major senses, right? And so that's... Okay, I can't have this for you. Yeah. I the Lord wants that bit more. Losing it all just on the trip. Mm-hmm. Because this trip, I think, is going to be a good destination. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this was, yeah, I think you guys are right. It's a very, it was a very humiliating experience for him to go through. Being someone as a, as a, some kind of position, going through this and becoming essentially physically nothing. But kind of the point, well, there's, there's really two points that, that I noticed from this passage. And one is that, you know, God calls the ungodly. Uh, this, this man is, was, Described as a, a horrible, evil, rebellious person in in light of God's way, and so this this one, like who was not just like a little good, like a little bad, or whatever. He was like fully against Christianity. God God humbles this man and has the power to do so. Jesus has the power to do so, and he and he uh, makes him fall fall to the ground and and uh, changes his life. So, that's encouraging in a way because we know that there are some people maybe in our lives or who we know who are <laughs> maybe at the present time extremely far from God right now. And um, we might be discouraged sometimes, maybe if they're family members or friends who are like, gosh, I don't know if these people are ever going to come to know God because they just seem like the exact opposite of... of uh, we're more like working and submitting to him. So it's it's an encouraging thing to know that um, that God does have the G, that Jesus does have the authority to do so, and that there's such a truth in the gospel, there's such a power in it that even people who are so resistant can can come to know and come to submit to Jesus. And then too that. Uh, something that we, we noticed last week was Philip's obedience and going and meeting with the Ethiopian man on the carriage. And here we see in this passage Ananias' obedience and kind of in spite of what makes sense. Um, I don't know about you guys. I'm, I'm, I'm less of an emotional person more of like a, a logic person, which can be good and then also can be bad sometimes. So uh, I struggle with this a little bit just because it's like, man, it seems to be kind of unreasonable, very logical for, for Jesus to request this. I would have some some like serious concerns. It's like, you know, who is this guy? This this guy is, is uh, we've heard that he's doing all these terrible things, and now you're asking me to go meet with him. Like, you know, what's going on? There has to be some, you need to give me a little bit more than what you're sharing with me kind of thing. I need to see a little bit more of the, of the plan here than what you're letting me in on. But Ananias, this man obeys uh, in spite of what seems to be a little bit illogical. And uh, that is also an encouraging thing and very rewarding as well. Once again, we, sing, we see from his obedience and more so obviously through the power of Jesus Christ and the gospel, we see this, life, this, this uh, man's life being transformed and 
not an insignificant one, right? Jesus, God, God used Paul so significantly um, for the writing of, of much of the New Testament that we have through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in him. So Ananias' obedience to Jesus' command to him to go and reach out to this man and preach the gospel to him is, has, an, has an amazing reward fantastic result. So, that's also encouraging to us here today to know that, you know, we we, uh, we have the opportunity to obey God's command, to uh, obey Jesus' command in Matthew 28 to um, with the Great Commission to, share, to preach the gospel and baptize people in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. So, those are two things that I noticed from this passage today that are a little bit more applicable to us and uh, encouraging at least to me. I don't know if you guys had anything else on that passage that you noticed or like to say real quick and then we'll um, talk about one thing super quick and then we'll be done. Just the difference between him and Peter. You know, mm -hmm. uh, the Lord threw Peter some curveballs too. No yeah. Showing him that, that the Gentiles had the same opportunity for salvation. And that, so I mean, he had to get Peter's attention. He had to get Paul's attention in a lot more dramatic way. Yeah. Uh, but between the two of them, I mean, they, they changed most of the known world with the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And and you would think, you know, Peter being uneducated mm -hmm. and Paul being very educated, that there would be a lot of conflict between the two. And granted, Paul did confront Peter with his preference yeah. for Jews at one point. Yeah. But when refused, Peter took it. Mm -hmm. And and then when Paul is attacked later, <coughs> Peter is, goes to his defense saying, you know, people twist the scriptures mm -hmm. and, and what he says is hard, but it's you can trust what he's saying. Yeah. <coughs> so I, I think it's an interesting dynamic between the two. It is. And they're both in part of the Church of Christ. Yeah. Uh, but they both have radically different visions. <coughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I'd say you're right. <coughs> you know, he was all in when he was persecuting the Christians, and then when he became a Christian, he was all in for that. You know, he, there, yeah. he was not this middle wishy-washy type guy. You know, he either went all the way or didn't. Yeah, yeah. That had to be disconcerting for the men he was traveling with, because one minute, oh, I'm going to kill him, you know, we're going to take him back. The next minute, oh, I'm, you know, well, I'm coming to preach gospel, you know? <laughs> yeah, 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 he's like, I like these guys now, they're good. They're good, don't start. <laughs> He's like, what? He's like, are we going to bring him back to Jerusalem? He's like, what are you talking about? These are, these are our brothers and sisters now. It's like, whoa. Okay. Oh, my gosh. Does ever say what happens to the guys who are with him, does it? No, it doesn't. No, Someone sure in does. the whole family will end up being baptized, assuming that, you know, they, he knows and they, they told the whole family about it. Yeah. But that's what he's saying, these guys did that. They no. Him. Yeah. They were at least nice enough to take him on into Damascus. They could have just left him on the road. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> Yeah. Like some of us do with our <laughs> friends at restaurants. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm sure there's a story behind that that we. <laughs> <laughs> but isn't it awesome though that God saw that potential in Paul, the most unlikely? Yeah. And no one else was like, okay, that's a major conversion. So this bad boy over here could actually do it too. Yeah. I always kind of like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because there's people you're like, my mother was not a believer until she got in her 60s. And I'm like, she's never going to do this because yeah. she was very anti God. Yeah. And not a nice person in the most. Yeah. But when she converted, her friends were like, what? <laughs> she's like, yeah, come to church with me. And I'm like, no, well, that's okay. <laughs> and they go, in a year, she's still going. And she was still going on her own. Okay. Yeah. 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 Thank you for sharing that. That's. It is. You're right, Tracy. I mean, it's. It's. I mean, it's a little bit what we were talking about before, and it sounds kind of cliche to say that you know God. God calls people who are unqualified or maybe very qualified in the other direction. <laughs> uh, but it's. 
But ultimately, we read Scripture and we see that that's true, and it's a powerful truth. And it's very easy to be pessimistic in this world when we see a lot of people who are very evil and do a lot of horrible things. And uh, to think like, man, you know, we just want to hit them or something. Like we want to, we want to take this holy vengeance on them. And where in reality, that this person, you know, may ultimately through through someone sharing the gospel with them, hearing the word, might uh, come to know the Lord. So it's a powerful truth that. Uh, we should probably be reminded of every once in a while. <laughs> yeah. Thank you guys for sharing that. Appreciate it. All right. So, um, real quick, last week we talked about the. Uh, well, let me let me pray. So I'll, I'll cut this video off, and then we'll we'll talk about that. Lord, we do thank you for your word and um, just the passage that we have studied this evening and what it reminds us of. It reminds us of your power, authority, and the truth of the gospel that can save the just most evil person. That you can forgive the sins of the most vile. And so, Lord, we thank you for this truth and the power of your mercy and your grace. For it is the... the this mercy and grace that we ourselves have received and that we rejoice in today. So we thank you for that. And uh, Lord, uh, in, the, in, in light of this passage, help us to, to go on this week um, and, and not see anyone as too far off. And also, you know, be obedient to your word, to, to, the, to the call to share the gospel uh, with these people who <laughs> seem to be very, very far away from you. So give us courage this this week, Lord, to do just that and power through your Holy Spirit in us. And we ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.